"'There is a thing which you call good, and another which you call evil?' "'Yes,' he replied. "'Would you agree with me in thinking that the corrupting and destroying element is the evil, and the saving and improving element the good?' "'Yes. And you admit that everything has a good and also an evil, as ophthalmia is the evil of the eyes and disease of the whole body, as mildew is of corn and rot of timber or rust of copper and iron, in everything, or in almost everything, there is an inherent evil and disease? Yes, he said, and anything which is infected by any of these evils is made evil, and at last wholly dissolves and dies? True. The vice and evil which is inherent in each is the destruction of each, and if this does not destroy them, there is nothing else that will, for good certainly will not destroy them, nor again that which is neither good nor evil. Certainly not. If, then, we find any nature which, having this inherent corruption, cannot be dissolved or destroyed, we may be certain that of such a nature there is no destruction. That may be assumed. Well, I said, and is there no evil which corrupts the soul? Oh, yes, he said, there are all the evils which we were just now passing in review, unrighteousness, intemperance, cowardice, ignorance. But does any of these dissolve or destroy her, and here do not let us fall into the error of supposing that the unjust and foolish man, when he is detected, perishes through his own injustice, which is an evil of the soul? Take the analogy of the body. The evil of the body is a disease which wastes and reduces and annihilates the body, and all the things of which we were just now speaking come to annihilation through their own corruption attaching to them, and inhering in them, and so destroying them. Is not this true? Yes. Consider the soul in like manner. Does the injustice or other evil which exists in the soul waste and consume her? Do they, by attaching to the soul and inhering in her, at last bring her to death, and so separate her from the body? Certainly not. And yet, I said, it is unreasonable to suppose that anything can perish from without through affection of external evil which could not be destroyed from within by a corruption of its own. It is, he replied. Consider, I said, Glaucon, that even the badness of food, whether staleness, decomposition, or any other bad quality, when confined to the actual food, is not supposed to destroy the body. Although, if the badness of food communicates corruption to the body, then we should say that the body has been destroyed by a corruption of itself, which is disease brought on by this. But that the body, being one thing, can be destroyed by the badness of food, which is another, and which does not engender any natural infection, this we shall absolutely deny. Very true. And on the same principle, unless some bodily evil can produce an evil of the soul, we must not suppose that the soul, which is one thing, can be dissolved by any merely external evil which belongs to another. Yes, he said, there is reason in that. Either, then, let us refute this conclusion, or, while it remains unrefuted, let us never say that fever, or any other disease, or the knife put to the throat, or even the cutting up of the whole body into the minutest pieces, can destroy the soul, until she herself is proved to become more unholy or unrighteous in consequence of these things being done to the body, but that the soul, or anything else, if not destroyed by an internal evil, can be destroyed by an external evil, is not to be affirmed by any man. And surely, he replied, no one will ever prove that the souls of men become more unjust in consequence of death. But if some one who would rather not admit the immortality of the soul boldly denies this, and says that the dying do really become more evil and unrighteous, then, if the speaker is right, I suppose that injustice, like disease, must be assumed to be fatal to the unjust, and that those who take this disorder die by the natural inherent power of destruction which evil has, and which kills them sooner or later, but in quite another way from that in which, at present, the wicked receive death at the hands of others as the penalty of their deeds. Nay, he said, in that case injustice, if fatal to the unjust, will not be so very terrible to him, for he will be delivered from evil. But I rather suspect the opposite to be the truth. 
and that injustice which, if it have the power, will murder others, keeps the murderer alive, ay, and well awake, too, so far removed is her dwelling-place from being a house of death. True, I said, if the inherent natural vice or evil of the soul is unable to kill or destroy her, hardly will that which is appointed to be the destruction of some other body destroy a soul or anything else except that of which it was appointed to be the destruction. Yes, that can hardly be. But the soul which cannot be destroyed by an evil, whether inherent or external, must exist for ever, and if existing for ever, must be immortal? Certainly. That is the conclusion, I said, and, if a true conclusion, then the souls must always be the same, for if none be destroyed, they will not diminish in number neither will they increase, for the increase of the immortal natures must come from something mortal, and all things would thus end in immortality. Very true. But this we cannot believe, reason will not allow us, any more than we can believe the soul, in her truest nature, to be full of variety and difference and dissimilarity. What do you mean? he said. The soul, I said, being, as is now proven, immortal, must be the fairest of compositions, and cannot be compounded of many elements. Certainly not. Her immortality is demonstrated by the previous argument, and there are many other proofs. But to see her as she really is, not as we now behold her, marred by communion with the body and other miseries, you must contemplate her with the eye of reason in her original purity. And then her beauty will be revealed, and justice and injustice, and all the things which we have described, will be manifested more clearly. Thus far we have spoken the truth concerning her as she appears at present, but we must remember also that we have seen her only in a condition which may be compared to that of the sea-god Glaucus, whose original image can hardly be discerned, because his natural members are broken off and crushed and damaged by the waves in all sorts of ways and incrustations have grown over them of seaweed and shells and stones, so that he is more like some monster than he is to his own natural form. And the soul which we behold is in a similar condition, disfigured by ten thousand ills. But not there, Glaucon, not there must we look. Where, then? At her love of wisdom. Let us see whom she affects, and what society and converse she seeks in virtue of her near kindred with the immortal and eternal and divine. Also, how different she would become if wholly following this superior principle, and borne by a divine impulse out of the ocean in which she now is, and disengaged from the stones and shells and things of earth and rock, which in wild variety spring up around her, because she feeds upon earth, and is overgrown by the good things of this life as they are termed. Then you would see her as she is, and know whether she have one shape only or many, or what her nature is. Of her affections and of the forms which she takes in this present life, I think that we have now said enough. True, he replied. And thus, I said, we have fulfilled the conditions of the argument. We have not introduced the rewards and glories of justice, which, as you were saying, are to be found in Homer and Hesiod. But justice, in her own nature, has been shown to be best for the soul in her own nature. Let a man do what is just, whether he have the ring of Gyges or not, and even if, in addition to the ring of Gyges, he put on the helmet of Hades. Very true. And now, Glaucon, there will be no harm in further enumerating how many and how great are the rewards which justice and other virtues procure to the soul from gods and men, both in life and after death. Certainly not, he said. Will you repay me, then, what you borrowed in the argument? Uh, what did I borrow? The assumption that the just man should appear unjust, and the unjust just for you were of opinion that even if the true state of the case could not possibly escape the eyes of gods and men, still this admission ought to be made for the sake of the argument, in order that pure justice might be weighed against pure injustice. Do you remember? I should be much to blame if I had forgotten. Then, as the cause is decided, I demand on behalf of justice 
that the estimation in which she is held by gods and men, and which we acknowledge to be her due, should now be restored to her by us. Since she has been shown to confer reality, and not to deceive those who truly possess her, let what has been taken from her be given back, that so she may win that palm of appearance which is hers also, and which she gives to her own. The demand, he said, is just. In the first place, I said, and this is the first thing which you will have to give back, the nature both of the just and unjust is truly known to the gods. Granted. And if they are both known to them, one must be the friend and the other the enemy of the gods, as we admitted from the beginning. True. And the friend of the gods may be supposed to receive from them all things at their best, excepting only such evil as is the necessary consequence of former sins? Certainly. Then this must be our notion of the just man, that even when he is in poverty or sickness, or in any other seeming misfortune, all things will in the end work together for good to him in life and death. For the gods have a care of any one whose desire is to become just and to be like God, as far as man can attain the divine likeness by the pursuit of virtue. Yes, he said, if he is like God he will surely not be neglected by him. And of the unjust may not the opposite be supposed? Certainly. Such, then, are the palms of victory which the gods give the just? That is my conviction. And what do they receive of men? Look at things as they really are, and you will see that the clever unjust are in the case of runners, who run well from the starting place to the goal, but not back again from the goal. They go off at a great pace, but in the end only look foolish, slinking away with their ears draggling on their shoulders and without a crown. But the true runner comes to the finish and receives the prize and is crowned. And this is the way with the just. He who endures to the end of every action and occasion of his entire life has a good report, and carries off the prize which men have to bestow. True. And now you must allow me to repeat of the just the blessings which you were attributing to the fortunate unjust. I shall say of them what you were saying of the others, that as they grow older they become rulers in their own city if they care to be, they marry whom they like, and give in marriage to whom they will. All that you said of the others I now say of these. And, on the other hand, of the unjust I say that the greater number, even though they escape in their youth, are found out at last, and look foolish at the end of their course, and when they come to be old and miserable, are flouted alike by stranger and citizen. They are beaten, and then come those things unfit for ears polite, as you truly term them. They will be racked, and have their eyes burned out, as you were saying. And you may suppose that I have repeated the remainder of your tale of horrors. But will you let me assume, without reciting them, that these things are true? Certainly, he said, what do you say is true. These, then, are the prizes and rewards and gifts which are bestowed upon the just by gods and men in this present life, in addition to the other good things which justice of herself provides. Yes, he said, and they are fair and lasting. And yet, I said, all these are as nothing, either in number or greatness, in comparison with those other recompenses which await both just and unjust after death. And you ought to hear them and then both just and unjust will have received from us a full payment of the debt which the argument owes to them. Speak, he said, there are few things which I would more gladly hear. Well, I said, I will tell you a tale, not one of the tales which Odysseus tells to the hero Alcinous, yet this too is a tale of a hero, Ur, the son of Armenius, a Pamphylian by birth. He was slain in battle, and ten days afterwards, when the bodies of the dead were taken up already in a state of corruption, his body was found unaffected by decay, and carried home to be buried. And on the twelfth day, as he was lying on the funeral pyre, he returned to life, and told them what he had seen in the other world. He said that when his soul left the body he went on a journey with a great company and that they came to a mysterious place, at which there were two openings in the earth, 
They were near together, and over against them were two other openings in the heaven above. In the intermediate space there were judges seated, who commanded the just, after they had given judgment on them, and had bound their sentences in front of them, to ascend by the heavenly way on the right hand, and, in like manner, the unjust were bidden by them to descend by the lower way on the left hand. These also bore the symbols of their deeds, but fastened on their backs. He drew near, and they told him that he was to be the messenger who would carry the report of the other world to men, and they bade him hear and see all that was to be heard and seen in that place. Then he beheld and saw on one side the souls departing at either opening of heaven and earth when sentence had been given on them, and at the two other openings other souls, some ascending out of the earth, dusty and worn with travel, some descending out of heaven, clean and bright. And arriving ever and anon, they seemed to have come from a long journey, and they went forth with gladness into the meadow, where they encamped as at a festival and those who knew one another embraced and conversed, the souls which came from earth curiously inquiring about the things above, and the souls which came from heaven about the things beneath. And they told one another of what had happened by the way, those from below weeping and sorrowing at the remembrance of the things which they had endured and seen in their journey beneath the earth, now the journey lasted a thousand years, while those from above were describing heavenly delights and visions of inconceivable beauty. A story, Glaucon, would take too long to tell, but the sum was this. He said that for every wrong which they had done to any one they suffered tenfold, or once in a hundred years, such being reckoned to be the length of man's life, and the penalty being thus paid ten times in a thousand years. If, for example, there were any who had been the cause of many deaths, or had betrayed or enslaved cities or armies, or been guilty of any other evil behaviour, for each and all of their offences they received punishment ten times over, and the rewards of beneficence and justice and holiness were in the same proportion. I need hardly repeat what he said concerning young children dying almost as soon as they were born, of piety and impiety to gods and parents, and of murderers, there were retributions other and greater far which he described. He mentioned that he was present when one of the spirits asked another, where is Ardias the Great? Now, this Ardias lived a thousand years before the time of Ur. He had been the tyrant of some city of Pamphylia, and had murdered his aged father and his elder brother, and was said to have committed many other abominable crimes. The answer of the other spirit was, He comes not hither and will never come. And this, said he, was one of the dreadful sights which we ourselves witnessed. We were at the mouth of the cavern, and having completed all our experiences, were about to reascend, when of a sudden Ardias appeared, and several others, most of whom were tyrants, and there were also, besides the tyrants, private individuals who had been great criminals. They were just, as they fancied, about to return into the upper world, but the mouth, instead of admitting them, gave a roar whenever any of these incurable sinners, or some one who had not been sufficiently punished, tried to ascend. And then, wild men of fiery aspect, who were standing by and heard the sound, seized and carried them off, and Ardias and others they bound head and foot and hand, and threw them down, and flayed them with scourges, and dragged them along the road at the side, carding them on thorns like wool, and declaring to the passers-by what were their crimes, and that they were being taken away to be cast into hell. Of all the many terrors which they had endured, he said that there was none like the terror which each of them felt at that moment, lest they should hear the voice, and when there was silence, one by one they ascended with exceeding joy. These, said Er, were the penalties and retributions, and there were blessings as great. Now, when the spirits which were in the meadow had tarried seven days, on the eighth they were obliged to proceed on their journey, and on the fourth day after, he said that they came to a place where they could see from above a line of light, straight as a column, extending right through the whole heaven and through the earth, in colour resembling the rainbow, only brighter and purer. Another day's journey brought them to the place, and there, in the midst of the light, they saw the ends of the chains of heaven let down from above, 
for this light is the belt of heaven and holds together the circle of the universe like the undergirders of a trireme from these ends is extended the spindle of necessity on which all the revolutions turn the shaft and hook of this spindle are made of steel and the whorl is made partly of steel and also partly of other materials now the whorl is in form like the whorl used on earth and the description of it implied that there was one large hollow whorl which is quite scooped out and into this is fitted another lesser one and another and another and four others making eight in all like vessels which fit into one another the whorls show their edges on the upper side and on the lower side all together form one continuous whorl this is pierced by the spindle which is driven home through the centre of the eighth the first and outermost whorl has the rim broadest and the seven inner whorls are narrower in the following proportions the sixth is next to the first in size the fourth next to the sixth then comes the eighth the seventh is fifth the fifth is sixth the third is seventh last and eighth comes the second the largest is spangled and the seventh is brightest the eighth colored by the reflected light of the seventh the second and fifth are in color like one another and yellower than the preceding the third has the whitest light the fourth is reddish the sixth is in whiteness second now the whole spindle has the same motion but as the whole revolves in one direction the seven inner circles move slowly in the other and of those the swiftest is the eighth next in swiftness are the seventh sixth and fifth which move together third in swiftness appeared to move according to the law of this reversed motion the fourth the third appeared fourth and the second fifth the spindle turns on the knees of necessity and on the upper surface of each circle is a siren who goes round with them hymning a single tone or note the eight together form one harmony and round about at equal intervals there is another band three in number each sitting upon her throne these are the fates daughters of necessity who are clothed in white robes and have chaplets upon their heads lachesis and clotho and atropos who accompany with their voices the harmony of the sirens lachesis singing of the past clotho of the present atropos of the future clotho from time to time assisting with a touch of her right hand the revolution of the outer circle of the whorl or spindle and atropos with her left hand touching and guiding the inner ones and lachesis laying hold of either in turn first with one hand and then with the other when ur and the spirits arrived their duty was to go on at once to lachesis but first of all there came a prophet who arranged them in order then he took from the knees of lachesis lots and samples of lives and having mounted a high pulpit spoke as follows hear the word of lachesis the daughter of necessity mortal souls behold a new cycle of life and mortality your genius will not be allotted to you but you will choose your genius and let him who draws the first lot have the first choice and the life which he chooses shall be his destiny virtue is free and as a man honors or dishonors her he will have more or less of her the responsibility is with the chooser god is justified when the interpreter had thus spoken he scattered lots indifferently among them all and each of them took up the lot which fell near him all but ur himself he was not allowed and each as he took his lot perceived the number which he had obtained then the interpreter placed on the ground before them the samples of lives and there were many more lives than the souls present and they were of all sorts there were lives of every animal and of man in every condition and there were tyrannies among them some lasting out the tyrant's life others which broke off in the middle and came to an end in poverty and exile and beggary and there were lives of famous men some who were famous for their form and beauty as well as for their strength and success in games or again for their birth and the qualities of their ancestors and some who were the reverse of famous for the opposite qualities and of women likewise there was not however any definite character in them because the soul when choosing a new life must of necessity become different but there was every other quality and they all mingled with one another and also with elements of wealth and poverty and disease and health and there were mean states also and here my dear glaucon 
is the supreme peril of our human state, and therefore the utmost care should be taken. Let each one of us leave every other kind of knowledge, and seek and follow one thing only, if peradventure he may be able to learn, and may find some one who will make him able to learn and discern between good and evil, and so to choose always and everywhere the better life as he has opportunity. He should consider the bearing of all these things which have been mentioned severally and collectively upon virtue. He should know what the effect of beauty is when combined with poverty or wealth in a particular soul, and what are the good and evil consequences of noble and humble birth, of private and public station, of strength and weakness, of cleverness and dullness, and of all the natural and acquired gifts of the soul, and the operation of them when conjoined. He will then look at the nature of the soul, and from the consideration of all these qualities he will be able to determine which is the better and which is the worse, and so he will choose, giving the name of evil to the life which will make his soul more unjust, and good to the life which will make his soul more just. All else he will disregard, for we have seen and know that this is the best choice both in life and after death. A man must take with him into the world below an adamantine faith in truth and right, that there too he may be undazzled by the desire of wealth or the other allurements of evil, lest, coming upon tyrannies and similar villainies, he do irremediable wrongs to others, and suffer yet worse himself. But let him know how to choose the mean and avoid the extremes on either side as far as possible, not only in this life, but in all that which is to come, for this is the way of happiness. And according to the report of the messenger from the other world, this was what the prophet said at the time. Even for the last comer, if he chooses wisely and will live diligently, there is appointed a happy and not undesirable existence. Let not him who chooses first be careless, and let not the last despair. And when he had spoken, he who had the first choice came forward and in a moment chose the greatest tyranny. His mind having been darkened by folly and sensuality, he had not thought out the whole matter before he chose, and did not at first sight perceive that he was fated, among other evils, to devour his own children. But when he had time to reflect, and saw what was in the lot, he began to beat his breast and lament over his choice, forgetting the proclamation of the prophet. For, instead of throwing the blame of his misfortune on himself, he accused chance and the gods and everything rather than himself. Now he was one of those who came from heaven, and in a former life had dwelt in a well-ordered state, but his virtue was a matter of habit only, and he had no philosophy. And it was true of others who were similarly overtaken that the greater number of them came from heaven, and therefore they had never been schooled by trial, whereas the pilgrims who came from earth having themselves suffered and seen others suffer, were not in a hurry to choose. And owing to this inexperience of theirs, and also because the lot was a chance, many of the souls exchanged a good destiny for an evil, or an evil for a good. For if a man had always, on his arrival in this world, dedicated himself from the first to sound philosophy, and had been moderately fortunate in the number of the lot, he might, as the messenger reported, be happy here and also his journey to another life and return to this, instead of being rough and underground, would be smooth and heavenly. Most curious, he said, was the spectacle, sad and laughable and strange, for the choice of the souls was in most cases based on their experience of a previous life. There he saw the soul which had once been Orpheus, choosing the life of a swan out of enmity to the race of women, hating to be born of a woman because they had been his murderers. He beheld also the soul of Tamyris choosing the life of a nightingale. Birds, on the other hand, like the swan and other musicians, wanting to be men. The soul which obtained the twentieth lot chose the life of a lion, and this was the soul of Ajax, the son of Telamon, who would not be a man, remembering the injustice which was done him in the judgment about the arms. The next was Agamemnon, who took the life of an eagle, because, like Ajax, he hated human nature by reason of his sufferings. About the middle came the lot of Atalanta. She, seeing the great fame of an athlete, was unable to resist the temptation, 
and after her there followed the soul of Epius, the son of Panopeus, passing into the nature of a woman cunning in the arts, and far away, among the last who chose, the soul of the jester Thersites was putting on the form of a monkey. There came also the soul of Odysseus, having yet to make a choice, and his lot happened to be the last of them all. Now the recollection of former toils had disenchanted him of ambition, and he went about for a considerable time in search of the life of a private man who had no cares. He had some difficulty in finding this, which was lying about and had been neglected by everybody else, and when he saw it he said that he would have done the same had his lot been first instead of last, and that he was delighted to have it. And not only did men pass into animals, but I must also mention that there were animals, tame and wild, who changed into one another and into corresponding human natures, the good into the gentle and the evil into the savage, in all sorts of combinations. All the souls had now chosen their lives, and they went in the order of their choice to Lachesis, who sent with them the genius whom they had severally chosen to be the guardian of their lives and the fulfiller of the choice. This genius led the souls first to Clotho, and drew them within the revolution of the spindle impelled by her hand, thus ratifying the destiny of each, and then, when they were fastened to this, carried them to Atropos, who spun the threads and made them irreversible, whence, without turning round, they passed beneath the throne of necessity, and when they had all passed, they marched on in a scorching heat to the plain of forgetfulness, which was a barren waste destitute of trees and verdure, and then, towards evening, they encamped by the river of unmindfulness, whose water no vessel could hold. Of this they were all obliged to drink a certain quantity, and those who were not saved by wisdom drank more than was necessary, and each one, as he drank, forgot all things. Now, after they had gone to rest, about the middle of the night there was a thunderstorm and earthquake, and then, in an instant, they were driven upwards in all manner of ways to their birth, like stars shooting. He himself was hindered from drinking the water, but in what manner or by what means he returned to the body he could not say. Only, in the morning, awakening suddenly, he found himself lying on the pyre. And thus, Glaucon, the tale has been saved, and has not perished, and will save us, if we are obedient to the word spoken and we shall pass safely over the river of forgetfulness, and our soul will not be defiled. Wherefore my counsel is that we hold fast ever to the heavenly way, and follow after justice and virtue always, considering that the soul is immortal, and able to endure every sort of good and every sort of evil. Thus shall we live dear to one another and to the gods, both while remaining here, and when, like conquerors in the games who go round to gather gifts, we receive our reward. And it shall be well with us, both in this life and in the pilgrimage of a thousand years which we have been describing. End of the Republic Read by Bobnefeld.